this is the time you can go to Sunday school, so we'll let you go on out. As the kids are making their way out, let me just give you a brief update from my family. Uh, many of you know that uh, my mom is battling stage four uh, cancer and she's under hospice treatment in Southern California. My dad is with her caring for her and uh, they now have some in-home help, which is allowing my dad to get some sleep um, several nights a week. Uh, we were encouraged last we spoke to them. Um, my mom's not in any pain. Um, she, she's doing okay. So um, thank you for your prayers. And I know a lot of you were wondering, so I wanted to give you an update. Okay, well, today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. And Advent is this period of waiting. It's a period of anticipation, of longing. We really are between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, so it's a period of reflection on his first coming and a, and a deep desire for us looking forward to when he comes again to right all wrongs. And so for Advent, we've been not only lighting candles, but we've been having a, a series of readings that come from the Revised Common Lectionary. That is a cycle of readings that the Protestant churches in America use throughout the church year. And so today we're looking at a reading from that cycle. Uh, the gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 1. And we're going to look at a particular song, Mary's song, also known as the Magnificat. Magnificat is a Latin term. It's from the first words that Mary says in her song in Latin, where she says, Magnificat anima mea dominum. My soul magnifies the Lord. So I would like to read this text for you, and then we'll pray and ponder it together. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Elizabeth is her cousin. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, and here comes the Magnificat, My soul glorifies or magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord, we pause and we ponder these words from so long ago. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would illumine them, and make them come alive in our understanding. For Jesus' sake. Amen. At Christmas time, Mary is much in focus. She's on Christmas cards and Christmas crushes, and we see her face smiling quietly from everything from famous paintings to postage stamps. Mary's an important figure at this time of year. The question is how important? Some would say very important. Some would say extremely important. Some would say even all important. In fact, within a persistent portion of Roman Catholicism, there is a perennial movement to urge the Pope to proclaim Mary as co-redeemer with Jesus Christ. Co-redeemer. 
let that sink in. For example, back in the 1990s, there was an article, a famous article in Newsweek, that highlighted a small but increasingly influential number of Catholics who at that time were signing petitions urging Pope John Paul II to use the power of papal infallibility to declare a new dogma, a new belief in Roman Catholicism. Their intended goal was to proclaim Mary as co-redemptrix, co-redeemer, mediatrix, mediator of all graces and advocate for the people of God. In support of this proposed dogma, the Pope received 4.3 million signatures from 157 countries. He averaged 100,000 signatures a month, and this at the time was an unprecedented movement within Roman Catholicism. As Kenneth Woodward, the author of the Newsweek article, wrote at that time, if the drive succeeds, Catholics would be obliged as a matter of faith to accept three extraordinary doctrines, that Mary participates in the redemption achieved by her son, that all graces that flow from the suffering and death of Jesus Christ are granted only through Mary's intercession with her son, and that all prayers and petitions from the faithful on earth must likewise flow through Mary who then brings them to the attention of Jesus. And Woodward continued in his article, this is what theologians call high Mariology, and it seems to contradict the basic New Testament belief that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. In place of the Holy Trinity, it would appear, there would be a kind of holy quartet. Now let's be clear and let's be fair. Not all Catholics agree with this movement then or now, including the current Pope, Pope Francis. In fact, some very influential Catholics particularly disagreed with this development. The Newsweek article reported that the Pope appointed a special commission to study the issue. He gathered specialist theologians called Mariologists, and they were called together to vote on this proposed dogma, and they voted 23 to 0 against it. They felt it was contrary to the teachings of Vatican II and insensitive to ecumenical relationships within the body of Christ worldwide. Other influential Roman Catholics also disagreed. In the Middle Ages, they, the focus on Mary intensified, and famous theologian Thomas Aquinas at that time urged that limits be placed on understanding Mary's role. In the mid-1960s, at the Vatican II Council, they placed limits on Mary's role as well. They made clear that, quote, Mary's role in no way obscures or diminishes the unique mediation of Jesus Christ. This document also stressed that Mary's titles are to be understood so that they neither take away from nor add anything to the dignity and efficacy of Christ, the one mediator. More recently, an influential Roman Catholic theologian also opposed this groundswell of fascination with Mary, saying that the proposed dogma is unscriptural and an affront to the uniqueness of Christ's redemptive death. Folks, that's the rub right there. That's why there's such global concern of elevating Mary to this exalted position. When you elevate Mary to be co-redeemer with Jesus Christ, mediator of all graces, this obscures the unique vision we have of Jesus and his important role in our lives. This is an extremely important point to grasp because the New Testament depicts Mary not in terms of her divinity, but in terms of her discipleship. In the Gospels, Mary stands for us as the epitome of the believer. She humbly believes in what the Lord has said to her and she willingly cooperates with God's mission. In no way does she detract from Christ's glory. Rather, she magnifies Christ's glory. My soul magnifies the Lord, she says, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Our text this morning and the text right before it shows us Mary as a model believer. She's our example. She's our role model. Let's think how. In the famous Annunciation scene that precedes our passage, Here's a painting of it, famous one by Giotto 
in the 14th century. In this famous annunciation scene, Mary hears the word of God through the angel Gabriel, and she quietly accepts its truth. In her well-known words, words which become an example for all of us, she says, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be done for me according to your word. The gift of Mary to the church is her humility, her willingness to serve the Lord. She's a humble peasant girl who accepts what the Lord says and acts on it at considerable cost to herself. That's the lesson of the Annunciation. Right after it comes the visitation. Here we have a picture of Ghirlandaio a little while later in the Renaissance. In the visitation, Mary's blessed by her kinswoman, Elizabeth. Elizabeth being filled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, you know, she's the first prophet in Luke's writings. In Luke Acts, the first prophet is Mary, a woman. Take that to heart. When Mary arrives, Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, says these words. She blesses Mary, and then she says, why? Specifically, she says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is Mary blessed by Elizabeth? Because she has quietly consented to bear Jesus Christ. She has agreed to carry out God's salvation plan to the world. And Mary has been given a token or of this amazing uh, role that she played. And it's this incredible word, theotokos. Mary is blessed because she bears, bears the word of God, and she is theotokos, which means God-bearer. That's an exalted title in itself. But there's another reason Mary is blessed. Mary's blessed not only because she bears Jesus Christ, the Son of God, she's blessed because she believes the Word of God. Elizabeth continues, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Bearing Christ, believing God's Word, these are the reasons that Mary is considered to be blessed. Not just by Elizabeth, but by all Christians. Mary stands for us as a believer par excellence, and she is our model. She's a woman who willingly submits to God's plan and bears Christ and continues to believe in all that God has said to her, treasuring God's word in her heart. And she is blessed. Mary's greatness lies in the way that she points to God. And this is clear in the first words of the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Think for a minute of a magnifying glass. I happen to have one right here. I don't always carry it with me, but today I am carrying it. A magnifying glass is an amazing tool. And I got this magnifying glass when I bought one of the treasures in my library at home, which is the Oxford English Dictionary Compact Edition. The Oxford English Dictionary Compact Edition takes 10 volumes of the premier English language dictionary and condenses them into two volumes. And in order to do this, the writing is minuscule. And so they sell the two-volume dictionary with a magnifying glass. And it's wonderful because you can go ahead and read uh, your entry with the magnifying glass, and it's super helpful. That's the whole point of a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass it does not draw attention to itself. I don't say, come on over and I'll show you my magnifying glass. Rather, I'll say, come on over and let me show you the treasures of the English language with my magnifying glass. Do you get the point? Mary magnifies the Lord. She she points to him. That's her focus. That's her purpose. And that's why we uh, consider her blessed. Mary is the magnifier. Her greatness lies in the clarity of her focus. She trains her eyes on the Lord Her vision of God's greatness and the greatness of God's plan is crystal clear. Through her, we see Jesus Christ, and through her, we see the Lord. And so our job is not to exalt the magnifier, but rather the Lord behind her. For to elevate the role of the magnifier, to adorn the magnifier with titles and ornamentation, is to obscure the vision that she gives us. We mustn't mistake the magnifier for what she magnifies. In fact, that's a good word for all of us at Christmas time, don't you think? We mustn't let good things obscure the best thing. Because our traditions, whether secular or religious in the season, can become so thick that they obscure the purpose of the season. We look at good things and we miss the best thing. 
We become so enchanted with the colorful wrapping paper that we miss the gift itself, himself. And so we need to remember the reason for the season, Christ himself, Christ with us. He is the focus. Because when the curtain goes up on God's Christmas pageant, the focus is not on Mary, not on Joseph, not on the manger, not on the animals, not on the wise men, not on the shepherds, and not even on the star. The focus is on the baby. He's the central focal point. I think the vast majority of Catholics understand this. And one of those Mariologists who advised the Pope against these developments exclaimed at that time, why waste so much infallibility, papal infallibility, on something that is not of crucial importance? Why indeed? In an online discussion hosted by Newsweek then, after the article was published, many lay Catholics stressed the same point. One person wrote, Mary was and is the perfect example of tremendous faith. She's a model of faith for all of us, but we Catholics do not, I repeat, do not put Mary before Jesus. Right on. That is a biblical sentiment that we can get behind as Protestant Christians. During that contentious time, there was an editorial written in Christianity Today. Critical of this new movement within a portion of Roman Catholicism, the executive editor, David Neff, ended his commentary positively. He urged Protestants neither to worship nor to neglect Mary, but rather to learn from her. We learn from Mary because she bears Jesus Christ. She carries him to us. She then believes in God's word and becomes a model for us. She treasures God's word in her heart. Mary is our teacher, and we are thankful for her. Mary is the magnifier. She magnifies the Lord. She bears the Son of God humbly and willingly at great personal cost. She believes God's word and acts on it. Above all, Mary points us to Jesus Christ, and that's where our focus must lie. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, we give you thanks for the vision that Mary saw, that Mary held on to and clung to in faith. We thank you for this amazing example to us. We thank you for the great treasure that she has borne. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to keep our vision focused on you with all that goes on in this season. We pray in your name.